Welcome to the Conduit Deeper Podcast, a podcast that takes a deep dive into the details that surround our current sermon series. From current events to fascinating finds to conversations that take us deeper into the Word. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Deeper Podcast. My name is Mo, Executive Pastor at Conduit Church, joined with our lead pastor, Darren Tyler, on this day, July the 24th, 2024. And the reason that I mentioned the date is the same reason that I mentioned it last week. I feel like we're going to have to be using the date for at least (laughs) the next four months, maybe four years. I, I just wanted to be clear that the day that we record and talk about current events so the folks that watch this in perpetuity yeah. know when we, when we when we were recording this because the amount of incredible events that are happening um, on a day-to-day basis changes. I, it's, it's so hard to keep up with. It's at an all-time high yeah. for the number of wild events in a short amount yeah. of time. There was a comedian that tweeted – after President Biden disappeared for however many days. And her her tweet was, our president hasn't been seen in however many hours, and that's still the third weirdest thing that's happened this week. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we think he might be dead in an hospice, which he was not. And that's still the third weirdest thing that's happened this week. I'm like, she nailed that. Like, as weird, that <sighs> should be number one weird, and still, no, it was like a distant third. That's right. And so, so that's what we're going to kind of open this up the same way we did last week. And, and we kind of have in the past is just kind of talk about some current events that are happening right now and then get into in, in somehow what we always do. Yeah. We tie well, this in. will be pretty easy. I mean, right, we, Babylon, totalitarian government, Genesis 11, <laughs> Tower of Babel, United States. This will, this is a, uh, this is an easy dunk. So for, this week, um, since we last met on this podcast, um, Joe Biden, our president, the the forty sixth president yep. of the United States, um, resigned from the from his nomination to be reelected. Yeah, okay, hasn't resigned from the presidency yet. There's still time for that if you're playing uh, election bingo. Um, but over this past week, so uh, I guess that was Sunday, the twenty first in the evening stepped down from the nomination process. But he did it in a, in a way that would only happen in the 21st century. And that is uh, submitting a, a a document, a, uh, an image uploaded to X (laughs) to his Twitter account. Yeah. It's like he submitted a formal written (laughs) two week notice resignation. Uh, No press conference, yet to have been a press conference about this. Um, All of the delegates, all of the the votes that have come in over this primary um, from each state uh, are now technically, technically speaking, no good because he has removed himself. Um, That gets into a whole other thing complicated understanding of how it works, the election process works. However, so he has stepped down again via X uh, with the push of a button with no press conference. His his White House staff found out, most of his White House staff found out via Twitter. Yeah. Uh, they, they said about a minute later they were all informed. Um, and... The resignation, um, again, if we're talking technicalities, was not on official presidential letterhead either. And the signature was questionable. Um, it it uh, maybe because he's, he, over the past week, he's been struggling with COVID. Maybe he's a little weak, um, had a hard time signing the document. But it, it, it the, the the signatures in question, it just doesn't necessarily look like all of his thousands of other signatures. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's just, it's just been a weird, <laughs> it's been a weird week. Um, and not to mention the fact that uh, up until yesterday, he had not been seen or, or technically heard from in six days. 
Um, yeah, that part, it's like when you're trying to not, again, Hanlon's Razor, you know, I try to never ascribe to conspiracy what can be explained by incompetence. And then they disappear for six days. You're like, well, come on, man. Like, it's like some of it you can explain thinking, okay, I remember when my grandmother had dementia, her handwriting changed because, you know, sure, she's changing. And, um, and so it's possible that that's what happened with the signature. I mean, possible. I mean, what we do know is that, well, we know he is, I say we know, he's resigned his candidacy or somebody resigned him from his candidacy. And that's kind of it. Like, I did read this morning that he's planning to address the nation tonight. Did you see yeah, that? Yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely more questions than answers. I yeah. think that's the where everybody's frustrated. And yeah. he is scheduled to um, address the nation this evening at 7 p.m. Central. Um, it, and even with that statement, people are still questioning it. Yeah. Um, because of deep fakes, AI capability— so there's a theory that he would, this wouldn't even be him tonight? Yes. Uh, there's wow. there's people just, they no one trusts anything out of Washington right now. Yeah. Um, is, is it actually Joe walking around in, in a mask? Uh, because that is, again, very plausible given um, their capabilities. The CIA has had high level mask making ability for their doubles for... 40 years, that is no secret. Um, people are questioning everything. Is it AI? Is 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 it a deep fake? Deep fakes and AI are so good right now, like you cannot tell the difference. Um, it takes some very um, very specific scrutiny to to determine whether or not something is digitally um, created or natural. Right. And so again, we're trying to always give the benefit of the doubt, tap the brakes, take the information in, not jump to yeah. conclusions. But every day that passes with the little stuff that's leaking here and there and people are talking and connecting the dots, it just makes it so difficult. Yeah. I, I would wonder if a good exercise would be to just think through, even if what has been said, what's been released is actually all there is to say and all there is to release. That's still really bad. Like, we don't have to have anything extra yes. than a president who sadly is struggling clearly with cognitive decline. I'm not a—obviously, uh, I'm not a doctor. I don't. But it sure looks an awful lot like my grandmother in dementia. Like, it just does. And nothing to do with age. I keep I just keep infuriating me when they make it about age, which is exactly what they're doing Um now that Biden has resigned, suddenly Trump's age is an issue for the Democrats when age was not an issue just five minutes ago. But it's not about age. It's about cognitive decline. And and so, again, if everything that we know is what is true, it's still really bad. A, a president in advance, because this was Reagan in the late 80s. I mean, he you know was beginning to show early signs of it. And it was just a few, not even a few years hardly, after he uh, finished his second term that he was dead uh, with Alzheimer's. Um, but if we have a president, like, I don't know that well, framers of our constitution didn't factor in dementia as a qualifying factor for it. And I don't know if, you know, the fact that he's refused to take a, uh, a, a cognitive test. And it's funny. I mean, his excuse was, well, I take one every day. It's called the presidency. And that's the point because you <laughs> failed it. So what we're looking for is some kind of proof that you can pass this thing. Well, just two weeks ago, he was doubling down that he would not step away. Yeah. And that changed pretty dramatically over the past 10 days. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's all kinds of discussion about how that changed, why that changed. Yeah. Um, well, if there's one thing that Democrats especially have been really, really, really good at is canceling somebody. Yes. And they have proven their loyalty. Uh, if, it, if, if I say they, this is human nature. If, they, if it benefits them specifically, they will turn on them in a dime. It, it's happened over and over again. I uh, think they forced his hand. I, I do too. I, I think Pelosi 
is behind most yeah. of it and said uh, yeah. over my dead body, which is actually she's away. She's she older than him. <laughs> yeah, but but you know it's interesting you say that. So she is, and that's actually a good example. She's crazier than a loon. Like she's San Francisco nuts, which is nuts. Like that's like extra level nuts. But she's still very cognitive. Like she's articulate. She, you know, she says weird things, but it's not because she's struggling for words. It's just that's Tuesday for her. But making it about age and not about cognit cognitivity. Cognition. Oh, how ironic is it that in, in a cognitive conversation, I cannot pronounce that word. <laughs> Maybe I need to get tested. But that if everything else is false and only that is true, that's still bad enough. And, you know, I think it's okay, I think, you know, when you're looking at stuff on Twitter and because, you know, you and I do that a lot. We'll trade back and forth. and But we have to be careful. We talked about it in the fog of war last week, whatever, but uh, was it Laura Loomer or something? Mm -hmm. You know, she's, talk, she's literally just fall balls out, like talking about the, uh, he's in hospice care. Well, I, I confirm sources and none of that seemed to have been true. Yeah. But because of that one person's reporting, suddenly Twitter is on fire from one idea mm -hmm. that turned out to not be accurate. And that's why we've got to be so careful with what we're seeing, with what we're retweeting, with what we're buying into, including this, you know, the prophet last week that we talked about who, you know, prophesied that a bullet was going to blow out his eardrum and, you know, we just have to be, just think, put on our thinking caps. God didn't ask us to check our brains out at the door. Um, and not just because it makes us look crazy, but because it makes us crazy. Like if you're constantly going down those rabbit holes that are false like that, it can make you crazy because then you don't know what's true and what's not. And prophetically speaking, um, you know, one of the, prophecies of the coming man of, you know, deception, the lawless man, whether it is that deception will prosper. And what happens right now is that what seems to get the most tweets, the most clicks, the most likes, which is monetized by these social media platforms is deception. So deception is actually literally prospering money, financially prospering. Yeah. So not contributing to that is extremely uh, important for our culture, but also just for our own self care for it that uh, I've been trying to balance out if I, if I, cause you know, I, just like you, I'll go down. I'm just fascinated. I'm reading I'm, But if I'm reading that stuff more than I am God's word or, you know, worship or st time in prayer, if I'm doing that, I can tell a difference in my own soul, in my own demeanor, even with it. And uh, it should be quite obvious that that's why, you know, I'm eating. It's like, I'm out there eating a bunch of junk food. Man, why, yeah. why do I feel so terrible right now? Well, maybe it was that bag of Cheetos I polished off last night and I don't feel so great because I ate a bunch of hydrogenated oil. So figuring out what's true and it, and it is possible to find out what's true. I think what gets complicated is that we're so used to it being so quick, you know, we need to give it a, you know, give it a minute. <laughs> yeah. Because we can, the truth is out there. We found it with COVID. It took us a minute. It took us searching. It took us researching. But, uh, but we did figure it out. It just it took weeks, not days. Right? It it took weeks, not minutes. That's right. And in a situation like this, and if there's any caution I could offer as a pastor, as a friend to my church family, these next four months, especially, I, I say next four months, like probably the rest of our lives. Yeah, at this point. Uh, but for sure in the next four months, there's going to be like, we, like it already has been stuff coming out that is true, stuff coming out that is unintentionally false, like people just have false reporting, I didn't know. And then stuff that's literally being reported that is intentionally false and deception. That's all there. We just have to be very prayerful. And if we're not in times of prayer, if we're not in the word, if we're not in worship, we are not going to be in a mindset to be able to decipher and to discern. And if there's anything believers need right now is the ability to discern. And uh, I would heavily encourage us, encourage myself, to focus on the big picture uh, and, and still have these conversations. It's important. We, you know, it's not an either or. We get to have these conversations. It's important to talk about, you know, the presidential election. I was reading just yesterday that 
quote unquote progressive Christians are orders of magnitude more political than conservative Christians, which you would not know that from legacy media, Julie Roy's, Russell Moore, whatever. They, they, they tend to think we're all the, if you're conservative, you're really political, but that's not accurate at all. But that, that said, they, they're political. They get to be political. You know, what they're really saying is we, we, we're political only because we're not towing, you know, certain aspects of what they want us to tow. Uh, but it's important because we do live in a culture where we need wisdom, we need discernment, and we need to talk about it. And ignoring it, you know, I, I, I read some pastors uh, talking a few, two weeks ago that they, I think I shared it last week on The Deeper, that they didn't bring up the attempted assassination because they just wanted Jesus to be glorified. I'm like, mm, that's not, that's a false choice, you know, to, there's this idea that if I intentionally ignore it, that I'm somehow being more noble. That's not true either. So we, that's why we have the deeper podcast. So we can go deeper and figure out whether our president is a deep fake. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be all kinds of, again, scrutiny tomorrow on the entire speech, um, which has to be pre-recorded. I mean, there, I, is he going to do this live? Is, is there, I think they're saying it's going to be live. Yeah, the report was that it was going to be live. I just can't imagine this thing being live. Well, I guess we're going to find out. But what I was going to say, though, I just want to finish. I'm going to finish off your thought. Um, so we have a choice every day whether the, to feed the spirit or the flesh. And then Paul talks about it a lot. We're going to speak. You can feed the spirit. You can feed the flesh. And I, when you feed the spirit. I believe discernment comes. The Holy Spirit is alive and well in you and it brings clarity and focus. <clears throat> when we feed the flesh, instead of discernment, I think we get discouragement and we get downtrodden and we feel the weight of the world. And and I just want to, again, encourage us to feed the Spirit each and every day through the Word, through prayer, through fellowship of like-minded believers, talking about the power of the word and what he's doing in our lives and not being consumed in our conversations with what is happening around the world. Again, it is super important that we be aware, right? Scared, not or prepared, not scared, but to feed the spirit, to give us discernment versus feeding the flesh, which is bringing discouragement to that point. Um, quick note, Netanyahu is addressing Congress today at 1 PM. They have put up fences around the Capitol. Good. Um, the pro-Palestinian protesters, um, supporters, however you want to say it, um, have already arrived and are causing havoc. Did you see what they did at the hotel, the I Netanyahu's did. hotel this morning? No, I did not. Oh, it's awful. Um, somehow, some way, they got into where he's staying and dumped buckets buckets of um, of maggots um, in the lobby and in the um, in the like the food area and just like just just destroyed wow. it um, and so yeah wow. I mean, it's, no I didn't see that yet yeah things are at a fever pitch of course um, our president not meeting with him not being available to meet with him when he arrived didn't help the temperature. Um, Kamala Harris, next in line, is uh, refusing to meet with him because of the optics with their base. She's actually, I think, in Indiana meeting with a sorority today. That actually checks out. Like that, she's probably better equipped to meet with a sorority than Netanyahu. Like, yeah. I mean, think about what that says. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, to the point where. He is going to address Congress today, but also uh, has reached out and said, "Fine, if 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 neither of you will meet with me, I would I'm requesting to meet with uh, former President Trump." <laughs> <laughs> and so apparently they're meeting Friday in Mar-a-Lago, uh, which is interesting yeah. that that would that 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 that's the path that this would go, that this U.S. trip would take. Um, that was not the plan. Literally two days ago, uh, they were not planning. They were not planning to make these diversions. Um, now he was for his trip. He was scheduled to meet with Biden, correct? Yes. Yes. Was the official excuse that Biden had the Rona? Yeah, that's the official excuse. Again, people know what no, no, people don't believe that because one, they're not sure exactly what's going on with Joe, 
And two, they fear that it's uh, bad optics for their base that he meets. Yeah. That the president, who is pro, seemingly pro Palestinian at this point, or his vote, yeah. their, their their voter base is to yeah. meet with. Uh, it, that's yeah. such a good example of a, and, and this has happened on the right and the left, the splintering yeah. fragmentation, because I'm old enough to remember when being, when supporting the only democracy in the Middle East, the only uh, pl place of peace and prosperity really in the Middle East with freedom, that that was, that was a bipartisan issue, including President Biden. Um, and now inside of their party, they've got, it's so splintered and fragmented that the tail is wagging the dog. Oh, yeah. And I don't know how, it, it feels a lot like a, a third world country when you've got, like when they do elections in Uganda or whatever, you know, there's a lot, of, they'll have like 28 candidates and they've all got their own little political <laughs> yeah. parties and their own, you know, very tribal. We have, you know, which is, it has its own downsides. We have quote, a, technically a two party system, but inside of those two parties, they are fragmenting. And I think in our lifetime, we'll at least see a third party emerge, if not multiple parties emerge that actually, obviously there's the Green Party. There's been, there's been attempts at this before, but it feels like for the very first time that it is plausible that it could happen. And if it doesn't, then inside of that, you've got the tail wagging the dog on both sides. The fringes are controlling the narrative just because they're the loudest, not because they're the largest you know, they're the most uh, petty, not the most powerful, but they are the ones making the most noise. It, it speaks to what you brought up on Sunday. And as we're continuing to dive into Genesis chapter 11, which is the Tower of Babel, um, this idea of madness of crowds. And we're seeing, I mean, we have seen this play out over the past four years specifically, what the madness of a crowd together, um, the conclusions that they can come to. Yeah, groupthink is... Yeah, groupthink, which we are seeing, plays out in a lot of kind of in a cannibalistic nature. Yeah. That's the splintering we're talking about. Yeah. Um, but this happened, and this is nothing new. No, it's humanity, including, so at Babel, uh, the plains of Shinar, it says they came together. They were of one language and <laughs> one speech. So one language and one speech. Interesting that it denotes those two separately. Yeah, because they're two different words. The word for language, Hebrew word is safa, and it just simply means the language we speak. We speak in English. Uh, we actually do not know what language Abram spoke. Like that language, we just don't know, but it was one language. One speech, uh, that word is pronounced devar, and it means saying the same word words. Uh, we would call it being politically correct in our modern vernacular. Could that be, could that be um, maybe summarized by just an ideology? A narrative, an ideology. A hundred percent what it is. Because if you are allowed to say certain words, that means you're not allowed to say other words. And history has taught us over and over and over again that the only way that that can fully be realized is by force and fear. They weren't of one speech uh, because they wanted to be. They were forced to be. And that, you know, by the time you get to the part where they're of one speech, this is reading between the lines of the Genesis story. But we don't know what happened to those who didn't buy into the speech, right? We just know that by the time God came down, he was putting a stop to it because whether it was Mao, Xi Jinping, Putin, Stalin, Hitler, uh, you know, name your dictator. One of the ways that they control is through language, through euphemism, through we've now changed the meaning of this word and, you know, and you're only allowed to say this word and we've seen it over and over and over again throughout history. And we're seeing it in our own society, like in our modern vernacular, it's being like, so uh, if, if words are violence, then there are certain words we shouldn't be allowed to say. 
The trouble is his words are not violence. Words are words. Speech is talk. It's not violence. But because that's become a cultural ideological narrative, you have things like what happened in Scotland, right, where they've passed a law just this last year. And, I, you know, like I've actually never read a Harry Potter book, not for religious reasons or otherwise. I just was, I mean, I'm, I'm a grown man, so I'm not reading, you know, kid books. But you got J.K. Is it two K's in the K? J.K.K. Rowling, or is it just J.K. Rowling? Whatever, Rowling. I mean, by the by, all definitions, a very liberal, very feminist voice is being called transphobic, is being called hateful, is being called homophobic. You know, for the simple crime of refusing to call a she a he or a he or she, like she's just the simple. And by the way, if you're looking for a fascinating podcast, um, Megan Roper, who used to be a part of Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas, uh, I, I knew them from my days in Kansas. Uh, in fact, I was, I think it was my Aunt Margie Roper that called me a lying whore false prophet. <laughs> Which was my Twitter handle for a while. <laughs> I had, it was Darren Tyler, lying whore, false prophet. But so Megan gets out of the church. And now, so this interview is, it's literally, I think it's like an eight episode uh, of her interviewing J.K. Rowling. Oh, wow. And the, the layers were fascinating because here's Megan Roper, who was burning Harry Potter books in the 90s, along with a lot of Christians. And here we are, fast forward. 2024, it's the progressives that are burning her books. So it's a weird, it was just yeah. a wild juxtaposition. And by the, neither one of her believers, and so they're coming to some conclusions that are at best questionable. But it was a really interesting listen for me to hear the how the extreme, you know, the, the, the pendulum can can swing. But the point is, is that when they pass this law in Scotland, you know, Rowling's like, "Come get me, arrest me, I dare you." Because the law right now being passed is there are certain things called hate speech. Homosexuality is a sin, would be considered hate, spe hate speech. Uh, there is no such thing as transgenderism, hate speech. And the way the law is written, you and I could be literally, uh, you know, at each, each other's house for dinner. We're talking about it. Someone reports us and we could be arrested for a hate crime. Because, again, if speech is violence, then that's violence and it has to be stopped at all costs. That's it's, of course, madness, which is where the idea of madness of crowds comes from, is that when you get together, united around, and I, I think that was, there's one thing I really wanted to drive home and want to drive home again. Unity is not the goal. Truth is the goal. If, if unity is the goal and you're unified around a lie, then it's delusion, and delusion is not a way to build a society. So, you know, I, I think I ruffled a couple of feathers when I said that there's no such thing as transgender. It's just a word that was made up to describe something that is literally physically impossible. Yeah. But in our speech, one speech, that would be considered hate speech because I am now hateful. And when in reality, what I'm saying is, no, that's not, it's not a physical, transgender is not a physical thing. Body dysmorphia is a mental thing. We want to help. We love, desperately want, who, if you struggle with that, you to get the help that you need. Clearly, you know, no amount of body mutilation, cutting off parts, trying to create new ones is going to change your mental condition. So we want that for you. But inside of Babel, they were united around a lie. And the lie was, we're better than God. We don't have to scatter into the earth. We're going to do what we're shaking our fist at the sky, quite literally, and they were united around that. And God was like, I've got to put a stop to this because if you're united, we, even if it's around a lie, you can't be stopped. And so it's from there that he confused their language and separated them out. Now, I didn't get into this on Sunday because I'm still sort of pondering it, but I'm wondering if the idea of even confusing their language was about creating new language, like Spanish, whatever, whatever it would have been called. That's the generally accepted thing, and it's probably it. But there's another option that I've been pondering, and it was not so much about uh, the actual language as it is confusing the speech itself. So one of the debates that, you know, I, I get emails, whatever, you know, for the pro, you know, you're pro-Israel, what about this, what about that? And 
but, but we're having two different conversations. They're talking about Netanyahu, and I'm talking about my Israeli friends. So that's confusing the language. We're, we're literally talking past each other, not to each other. And, and so maybe some of the confusion, even what we're having in our, in our own country, is actually God helping us right now to keep us from uniting around a lie. Maybe. Um, I, I do know the modern world we're in right now, we are under one language again. It's ones and zeros. There's a reason why AI is referred to as a large language model because it scrapes the internet for the words and then creates, so to speak, a language, you know, ones and zeros. And inside of the ones and zeros, like we saw last week, you, there are, there's common speech that you're allowed to make and common speech that you're not allowed to make. So being of one language in one speech is exactly what Google Gemini is attempting to do. Uh, and we definitely need to be aware of that. Yeah. I mean, even just, uh, even just the words artificial intelligence, AI, LLM, large language models, <clears throat> that in of itself hasn't really been defined as to what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, AI is thrown around as basically all new technology, and that's that's not accurate either. Um, AI is just a kind of a catch-all for artificial intelligence, and that's in, even that phrase itself isn't complete. Mm -hmm. So it's all these different words that are trying to uh, encapsulate an idea or a thought of what future learning looks like. Another way of saying madness of crowds, though, is something that you that you brought up and you titled the message, uh, mass formation psychosis. It's another way of kind of saying that. Yeah. Which became popular in 2021 specifically when uh, Dr. Robert Malone was on the Rogan show and started talking about this. He was, re he was referencing the, um, and, and we've talked about this, man, if you go back to our, our podcast from three years ago, you'll, you would hear us talking about this as well. But the Belgian psychologist, uh, Matthias Desmet is who uh, coined the phrase specifically um, mass formation. And then Robert Malone added psychosis to it just because how crazy the world became in believing one central idea with no real questioning, no critical thinking, everybody kind of walking in lockstep towards a, a central direction. That's the mass part, mm -hmm. the formation of this idea. It's, it, I just felt it was a really interesting way to kind of frame yeah. uh, the past four or five years in, in our country and in our world um, in, in comparing that to what happened in the plains of Shinar also known as Babylon. How did you come to that kind of integration? I mean, we lived it, you know, like there's moments where you think, are we, are we crazy? Are we like the only, <laughs> like, like being, you know, corporately gaslit by an entire country was a weird feeling. And, you know, I was a little lonely during those days, you know, friends that we thought were friends, Turns out they weren't. And by the way, for people that I, you know, didn't know or became friends, so it was a reshuffling of the deck. But when you read what the Bible says here, when, if they continue in this way, then nothing can stop them. Uh, that being mass formation psychosis, you know, maybe synchosis would be a different way of wording it because psychosis sort of gives it like a medical ideology. This was born out of rebellion, not out of uh, a disorder. But, you know, just kind of like alcoholism addiction, when you ask Mike Coop, is it a disease or is it a sin? And he says, yes, you know, the guy from Place of Hope, because it starts with sin, starts with pride. But then eventually what you started as a choice to rage against God is now something you can't stop. And that's where the psychosis part feels like it comes from, is you have to wake up from that. And, you know, what we saw, what we see here in Genesis 11 was God said, do this, go into all the earth, you know, subdue it, be multiplied, spread out, scattered. And then in Genesis 11, they're saying, we're going to build this city so that we won't be scattered. And it was as simple as that. It was pride. I know better than God. And that's, it just doesn't end well in a country or in, in, in an individual. And the danger of it 
in our own that we have to be aware of is not to get sucked up into it because it's so easy to get caught up in it when everybody but you, it seems like, is saying it. Yeah, when you're the minority in a mass formation, yeah, which is what we felt like um, three short years ago, three of the longest years ago and three of the shortest, quickest yeah. years ago. Um, when you're the minority in the mass, um, there's yeah. repercussions there too. Well, and when the the general narrative, I'm so, you know, I've heard it said that you you know a country's religion by its blasphemy laws. Like, what are you allowed to say? What are you not allowed to say? Pakistan is a Islamic country. You are not allowed to say that Allah is not God. That's their blasphemy law. Our blasphemy laws are, well, at least in those days, we're not allowed to question anything about COVID. We're not allowed to question any of the statistics. We're not allowed to, like, the, the, and, and then they control it, not by one king in one throne, but literally by controlling uh, whoever had the microphone, the media, the internet, the government, they were working in tandem together to, because if you, I, well, here's what I remember. We did a poll of our church family. It was like five questions. I don't even remember what they were. You probably would. Because in April, it may, it was still like, okay, it felt like everybody, including people in our own church family, and I don't blame any of them. You know, I remember people that I love dearly who are part of our church family that, we just didn't trust that that we were doing the right thing. In fact, that last Sunday that we gathered before we shut down, to this day, one of my greatest regrets that we did six it, weeks that we did it at all. Yeah, six weeks. But do you remember there was like two hundred people there that day, yeah. and I was already getting the emails yeah. with it, and I. But we did a poll, just asking our people. This is a few weeks later now. Are you ready to come back now? Are you ready to come back with restrictions? I can't remember. There's like four others. Or, or I'm not. I'm not ready. Don't know when I will be. Whatever it was. And what I remember of that was it was basically 85 percent were ready to come back right now, or ready to come back with a couple of um, precautions. But it was the it was only 15 percent that weren't. But they were the loudest. So it felt like we were alone. But that gave me a great deal of peace. You know, we still would have done it, even if it had been opposite, because it was right and we knew it and we weren't making these numbers up. We were reading, we were studying. But the control of the media, the control of everybody that seemed to have a microphone, right, from Chris Cuomo to Chris Christie, they were all saying the same thing right here. They were all saying the same thing. Including the president at the time. Including the president. I've Donald not for, J. Trump. I've not forgotten, and I, I don't think I've forgiven him either. You know, was, and I get it. He, he he was surrounded, but so was Ron DeSantis, and he figured it out. So was Christy Noem. She figured it out. It was not unknowable. Um, I remember and, speaking of like mass mass formation psychosis. I remember a trip that we were on three years ago, um, to <clears throat> to Wyoming. And then on the way back, we played a little game. I don't know if you remember this. <laughs> on the way back, we played a little game through Denver Airport, uh, probably because we were just uh, frustrated with the world and you know, living wild and free, uh, coming off of a great trip and heading back home. And at that time, twenty summer of twenty one, if you weren't wearing a mask, you were you were a bad boy. I forgot about that. I mean, I didn't forget about the mask, but I forgot about what you were about to say. And yeah. So we, we got to the Denver airport. We made a pack to not wear, to see how far we could go without wearing a mask. And it's just because we, we had done the research and had yeah. felt confident that. Yeah. A, wearing a diaper on our face wasn't really going to do anything. The mask yeah. was not. Yeah. And so, and so we, we stepped out of the, the car and headed into the airport on a Friday, safe to say at a Denver airport, I mean, thousands, thousands of people. Yeah. I don't know if it's tens of thousands, probably too, too, too large. No, it's probably tens of thousands. Tens they, of it's thousands. a massive airport. And, and I, if, if I'm lying, I'm dying. <laughs> All of them were wearing a mask. Yeah. I, I, it felt as if, and if you looked around, that you and I were the only ones not. Yeah. When you go through those turnstiles or whatever it is, the... The the uh, 
the, the whole, TSA kind of thing. Yeah, you know yeah. when you're trying to get up to you know to check in, and there's you, you, the the lines are going the switchbacks back and forth, back and forth, and everybody's just looking at you like you are an alien. How could you? With, yeah. Uh, vitriol and uh, I mean just, but no one said a thing. Yeah. Not one person asked us or told us. No security guards, not even a person in line. They just looked at us mean. Yeah. And I remember getting all the way up to the, finally, all the way up to show them my, you know, my, uh, reg, whatever it's called. My, uh, identification. Identification <laughs> and, and my boarding pass. And I'm ready to put it on just because, you know, it's the security guard up there and, she, you know, she's looking at me funny. And she says, oh, no, 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 keep it off. I, I need to look at your... Your identification. Because yeah. you can't pass COVID at a TSA <laughs> checkpoint. Clearly, it's one of the places where it is exempt. Yeah. So we made it all We made it all the way into the plane. And then on the plane, uh, kept it off as long as possible because there was a little caveat. Yeah. You didn't have to wear a mask if you were chewing. Yeah. So we made that bag of pretzels last about oh, yeah. two and a half hours. <laughs> I would actually buy like a bag of something like just so I could. And you can, turns out you can nurse a Diet Coke <laughs> for about two hours, you know. Across like, the whole Midwest. Yeah. One of my favorite moments from that was a DFW, not from that particular trip. But um, once w once we realized that this was dumb, uh, and, and we would just, I mean, this was our, I think, our kind of official position. If a, if a local business wanted us to wear a mask, then we would either wear it or we would just go shopping somewhere else. Like, I didn't want any of our staff making a scene, and not just because I didn't want them to end up on YouTube. Um but I mean, that's why I switched from Costco to Sam's because Costco were mask Nazis and Sam's for some reason just didn't care. So I'd go to Sam's instead of Costco and I still do. But in DFW, some random airport employee with zero authority stopped me. It's the only time. And I, I, mm. the minute I stepped off a plane, the mask came off, you know, the minute I stepped, you know, through whatever it was off. And it was right around the time that Fauci had made the announcement, which he then retracted like a couple days later because he looked like an idiot, that we needed to wear two masks. Yeah, the double mask era. Yeah. And so the guy, you know, said, hey, you're not wearing a mask. I'm like, hey, uh, I, I noticed you're only wearing one. And Fauci, uh, actually, he said the, uh, whatever the uh, standards are. I was like, well, actually, the standards are two. And I see you're only wearing one. So I'm going to let you slide this time. <laughs> but if I see you again, and I just walked off <laughs> I don't know what he was because his face was covered, but he, and he was wearing one of those cloth ones that you you know you can't even like soak up ketchup with, let alone viruses. But it was that was the only guy that ever said. I will say, one of the rare pleasures during that time was occasionally, and I mean only on occasion, you'd look across and you'd yes. see what someone else without yes. a mask, and you give each other the mm -hmm. nod. It was like the equivalent of being yes. in the Jeep Club, the Jeep wave that people give each other if you're in a Jeep. It was like a silent fist bump. Yeah. Of solidarity. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're, yeah. we understand what's going yeah. on here. I, I, I do remember, remember that? that. Oh, my I gosh. I remember our uh, Michaela was in the mall and they were uh, standing in line at the Apple store. Yeah, I remember this. And uh, so tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but this is how I remember it. Uh, they tried to make her put one on, but it's in the mall, not in the Apple store. So she said, I'm not putting it on. And, uh, the, and then when people, a few people around her were like, we, we don't have, so they all started taking them off. Like, not all of them, but a few of them started taking them off because they realized they just, they just needed somebody to be courageous. And that's the point of these stories, right? It's yeah. like this mass formation psychosis requires the truth to penetrate through. Yeah. And think about the psychosis moment of that. I mean, we laugh about it now, but they were deadly serious. Like you walk in and you still see them on occasion, like these plate glass, you know, plexiglass windows that were supposedly, because apparently they don't know how air works. You know, that if you sit down, apparently you can't spread COVID. Like that's psychosis. It's psychotic. But the, that was the rule. And people were enforcing those rules. And going back to Babel, that was the danger that God saw. It, not that we are here now, but that's where it can go. And at this point in history, in Genesis 11, the whole world population might have been a few hundred thousand tops. And they're talking about the entire world under one totalitarian government. And here's the thing. There is going to be a Babylonian empire under one rule, one world government, but not yet, not in Genesis 11. So the one world government was forming here, and God says, we got to stop it. Now, he's going to allow that 
in a future moment when the man of lawlessness and, you know, all these different names for antichrist, but the one world government unified around a lie is coming to a theater near you and to a reality near you. But he had to stop it here because it would have destroyed humanity. And again, it's why he has to stop Antichrist, because eventually he would have destroyed it all anyway. So there's a scriptural idea to that. If, if he would have let it go any longer, the whole world would be destroyed. And that was Genesis 11. So this was not an act of cruelty by God. It was an act of mercy. It was an act of goodness by God to save humanity from ourselves. The word Babel in Hebrew is Bilal. I'm sure, I, don't, I can't remember if you discussed this on Sunday. I did not. Specifically, in, in Bilal in Hebrew just means confusion. Yeah. Um, and so that city of Babylon was uh, brought confusion. And <clears throat> many times we, we've, we've referenced the phrase or we say that, you know, we're, we're living in a time of Babylon now. Um, it's not far-fetched to think that we're living in a time of confusion Case in point, right now, uh, who's who's our acting president? Who's in charge? <laughs> who's in charge? I know it's I know it's Joe, um, but his 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 health is deteriorating, and there's not a lot of transparency about what's actually happening. Um, he's he's given over some of his authority to run uh, several parts of of the of his departments. Uh, recently, even this week, he's he's handed off. Um, uh, authority um, for, for uh, specifically for Ukraine, like he's handed that completely off to somebody else now. There's different chunks mm. of responsibility that he's been handing off over the past week, and I don't know if it's he, it's his handlers, whoever. Um, it's it's like they're preparing for the potential of of him um, no longer leading um, between now and November or January. Yeah, I mean. He's not capable of running for president is what they've very much, very clearly said. He's not good enough to do this. He's not well enough mentally, which should mean that he's not well enough right now to run the presidency of the United States of Scary America. Scary thought. It really, it really is. is. And it's, it, it has definitely caused me, and I hope it's causing our listeners, viewers to do the same, which is to pray. Pray. This is what Paul says. We should pray for those in authority that we might live peaceable lives. This I can't think of a better example of praying for a leader so that we might live peaceable lives. You know, Paul would have been, of course, talking at a time. I think I don't know if Nero would have been in charge at that point, but you know, they had, you know, Rome had obviously the Caesars and the emperors, and then they had the, the regional government governors and all that stuff that was going. You know, he's that's who he's talking about. Pray for those people, and. It's, uh, it, it is good for us. It's why we're praying on Sundays. It's why we pray for President Biden. We may not agree with him, but we can pray for him, for our own. And if there's never been a better, better time in my heart and mind to be praying for our nation right now, because as the news media cast, you know, Trump as being unstable and all those things for four years, They've completely ignored the fact that we've got a, a, a president that, bless his heart, is struggling. And I don't know how it works if you wake up. Uh, when my grandmother had dementia, and I'm not suggesting that President Biden is doing this, but I mean, there were moments my grandfather would wake up in the middle of the night and couldn't find her. And she was on her hands and knees in the basement because the FBI was after her in her head. Uh, the, it's a cruel, cruel disease. It, um I, I, I might have been Nancy Reagan that coined the phrase, the long goodbye, because they're gone before they're gone. And that, that was true of my grandmother. You know, she was actually the one sort of normal matriarchal figure in my entire family. <laughs> and she, you know, she wasn't after that. And, you know, so we said goodbye multiple times over what turned out to end up being 15 years. But I wouldn't have put her in charge of anything at that point. I wouldn't have given her a checkbook. I mean, after she had passed, my dad found her wedding ring in the back of the toilet tank. Nobody knows why it was there. It just, it was, yeah. you know, they, they just knew she'd lost her wedding ring and here it was, he found it. Um, so here's a, you know, our president right now, he, I don't believe that he's crawling around on his hands and knees. And at the same time, we don't know. We just know that the circle is tight, that 
it's reported in the journal, even in the New York Times, that people who should have access to him do not have access to him. So that something has not only been hidden in plain sight, but is being hidden even more than it was before. So pray, pray, and keep praying. <clears throat> there's there's so much more to discuss. It's just I, you try to try to find a balance in all of it, right? Um, who 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 do you think? I mean, we're going to wrap this up here shortly, but who do you think is going to be the Democratic nominee? I know it's Kamala right now. Yeah. Do you think it she'll end up being on the ticket? It has to be. They they have DEI'd themselves into a corner. Do you I mean, think about it, if they don't? The, everything that well, they've said, we, you know, we're elevating females. Great, awesome. Elevating people of color. Awesome, great. She was chosen. Biden said, I cho- I'm choosing, I'm choosing whoever I'm choosing because she's a woman. Is there, is there another woman, is there another female and a woman of color that could enter the scene? Besides Condoleezza Rice? <laughs> Michelle Obama. I don't think she'll do it. Here's, let me, let me reframe that. If she does, she wins. I know. <laughs> it's, it's checkmate. This is what I'm saying. But I don't think, do you see a path in which they could do that? Uh, without yeah. a without a democratic civil war, I don't think they care. I think they've proven they don't care. I think the DNC is going to be wild. It is what three weeks away. Uh, I think it's two weeks away. Actually, I I'm just saying I I don't know. Yeah. I'm you know they talk about you know DEI female woman of color. Oh, it's checkmate in in Kamala. Kamala no, she she is not revered or respected within the White House. Um, it's just it's just all for show. And if but if you're talking about again a female woman of color that is respected, yeah, that is lauded amongst the Democrats, yeah, um, is revered. Right. It's it's it would be an opportunity for yeah. them to prop up Michelle, yeah, um, and and allow uh, Obama to have a fourth term, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Third obviously, term being obviously, obviously, we, I was going to say, obviously, we've we've done this before, right? Uh, where Hillary, pretty, after probably. Bill went, Hillary went. You know, it was her turn. Yeah. Um, I, I if if they do, she wins. She is. I don't like anything about her politics. I don't like anything about her morality. I don't like anything uh, about ideologies. But she is a likable person. Um, it's the old, you know, beer test. Would I have a beer with that guy or that girl, you know? <laughs> and, uh, I, I would not be able to leave fast enough from a meeting with Kamala Harris. Just her voice alone. This is so shallow, so petty. I know. I know. But just when she talks, it annoys me so much. I feel bad for her husband. I'm like, oh my gosh, she has to wake up every morning to that voice. Bless her heart. Unburdened <laughs> oh, by what has been. Yeah, just like word soup, man. I'm like, I don't, it's not even a salad. There's no <laughs> substance to it. It's like some sort of gruel coming out of her mouth. But just that alone, I couldn't. She says things it. like, today was yesterday's tomorrow. It's deep. Uh, it's true. It, it, but she she uses those phrases uh with a straight face, like it, she's saying inspiring. something. Inspiring, yeah. And so when you factor that in, she's not only not inspiring; <laughs> she's just annoying. Like it's like some character on a oh. sitcom that you're like, ugh. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, again, we're just we're just shooting the <laughs> shooting the breeze here. I mean, why not? It's 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 crazy. Every week is crazy. Yeah. We're just trying, you know, kind of kind of laugh to keep from crying yeah. sometimes. Of what's going on in this country? Obviously, we're praying and yeah. And and trying to keep folk, we are trying to keep focused on the hope that we have, um, in the big picture, but at the same time, also kind of on the edge of our seats and guessing of what's next. Yeah, You're like what are we going to be talking about a week from today? Uh, yeah, and maybe it's that Michelle Obama <laughs> enters the chat. Enters the chat. <laughs> but I mean, Kamala has wasted no time. Let's be honest; like she's working the delegates right now. Like you know, she has wasted no time. Uh, President Biden. Obviously in, endorsed her. I, I guess it was an endorsement of her. It's all a charade, man. It was in some. It was like a sentence or something. But um, but I think that it, it, any of the other candidates they have that could win, Michelle Obama, notwithstanding 
they couldn't do it without absolutely causing a, a an uproar. They're talking about Kamala's. Is it Kamala or Kamala? Can we put this to rest? I, I don't know. Caramel. I feel bad. Caramel. Ka- Kamala. Yep. Um, there came out this morning that she's considering Pete Buttigieg. Buttigieg. Uh, our depart. Our department of uh, our secretary of uh, transportation. The the former mayor of South Bend. Uh, as her VP. <laughs> My favorite part is it's. Like, it's South Bend. Like, have you been to South Bend? I have. Yeah, I have too. Like, it's like being the mayor of Columbia. All due respect to Columbia. That's really not like a qualification Notre- for president. Yeah. Like, I was the mayor of a mid-level town in Notre Indiana. Dame is in South Bend, so, I mean, they got that going for them. Yeah, but you've been to South Bend, right? <laughs> like, the skyline is a hotel with, like, eight yeah. stories. Like, it's not a... Well, it's interesting because uh, the one of the other potential VPs that that she's vetting uh, was, I think, is it Josh Shapiro from Pennsylvania. Mm, um, I didn't realize that, but that is they're getting pushback because he's Jewish. Now she's married to a Jew. This is what I'm talking. It, it, a lot of moving parts. The splintering, the cannibalism, the the. They're trying to appease everybody, and in the in, in while doing that, castrating everyone. Yeah, have you? I I have Identity absolutely politics. zero knowledge of her husband at all. I didn't even know he was Jewish until I don't know, like a week ago. Mm. But it is intriguing to me that she has refused to meet with Netanyahu when her husband is Jewish. Yeah, how does how does how does that work at dinner? Like when they're talking about it. Yeah, like it, it seems now. I don't know if he, I say that he may be Jewish in the way Jerry Seinfeld is Jewish, but even secular Jewish people like Seinfeld are getting emotional about what's happening. Because at the end of the day, they talk about the Israeli state government, whatever, but the, the, the Muslims make no differentiation whether between the state and between Jews. Like it, it's, it's anti-Semitism. And so he, it's interesting that he's married to someone that's trapped in a, in a party right now that's, that it hates his people. Well, thanks for shooting the breeze with us, those that are listening and watching. If you've made it this far. We are just uh, kind of at a loss for words for everything that's happening. But it, it needs to be noted that we have wrapped up our series. No, we're wrapping it up this week. The Gospel According to God, uh, Chapter 11. Are you doing a Chapter 11 or are you doing an overview? I'm going to end, uh, well, I'm going to end Chapter 11 and then synthesize sort of an overview into yeah. it. I'm just really intrigued by Abram was told, leave your father's house, go to Canaan, chapter 11, and chapter 12, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 12, leave your father's house, but we, but we see that he actually went with his father, the very person God said, leave them all, go, and then they end up stopping halfway. So there's a, there's a lesson for us about half obedience is still full rebellion. That's good. And uh, so that's going to be the... The over, but, the, but again, half obedience is still full rebellion is literally the story of mankind. Heading into August, what's our next sermon series? A field guide for a fallen world. First Peter and second Peter. First and second Peter. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go through one of the most, uh, 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 two epistles written to a group of people living in the most tyrannical, oppressive government, maybe in history. Um, and how did they live in that? And that was Peter's instructions to them. That should be applicable and timely. Seemingly. (laughs) Seemingly. (laughs) Heading into an election fall and everything that's going on in our country right now. No, I love it. I'm excited for that. Um, Thank you for those that are joining us. Uh, Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We appreciate the feedback and the comments um, that you would just take uh, maybe about an hour of your, your day. Um, once a week just to, to sit in with us as we, we dive into current events, we dive into scripture and I'll remind folks of the bigger picture and the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you for joining us this week. We'll be back with you next week.